My name is Bart van der Vossenberg, and this is presentation 1.2 from Genome to DNA Barcoding of the Practibar course package. During the Practibar course, background information and hands-on training is provided for the use of DNA barcoding in the framework of plant health. In this presentation, we'll be giving you background information on the building blocks of life, DNA barcoding as a method, and DNA barcoding particularly in the framework of plant health. The genome is the sum of all genetic information of an organism. And in many viruses and prokaryotes, this consists of a single linear or circular molecule. In eukaryotes, we can find linear chromosomes, and in addition, circular mitochondrial, and in the case of plants, chloroplast genomes. Typically, genome sizes increase with the complexity of an organism. And in the framework of plant health, the smallest genomes we can find are those of viroids, which consists of only 360 nucleotides. This in contrast to plant genomes, which can go up to over 100 gigabases. Generally, an inverse relation between the genome size and a mutation rate is observed. So typically, smaller genomes tend to have a higher mutation rate, compared to larger genomes, which tend to have a lower mutation rate. But for these larger genomes goes that it can vary strongly between regions. For instance, coding versus non-coding regions in which the coding regions tend to be more conserved. And the same applies for core chromosomes when comparing them to the mutation rate of supernumerary chromosomes, which tend to be higher. Also, in repeat-rich regions, higher mutation rates are often observed. Also, within coding regions, the third base of a triplet or a codon tends to have a higher mutation rate compared to the other positions in a triplet. Cells must handle amounts of DNA many times longer than the cells that they are in. In order to achieve this, several orders of condensating by coiling the DNA and folding it are applied. So from the DNA double helix structure to the secondary coiling forming nucleosomes to the chromatin fiber and packing in even tighter cores all the way to the chromosome structure. The genetic information itself is stored in DNA or RNA, which stand for deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid respectively. The molecules are made up from monomers or nucleotides, which consist of a 5-carbon sugar, a pentose, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. And the names of DNA and RNA are derived from the sugar molecules. On the left-hand side, you can see the sugar molecule present in DNA, the deoxyribose. And on the right-hand side, you have the sugar molecule present in RNA the ribose. When we are talking about orientation of a DNA or an RNA molecule, we are talking about 5' prime and 3' prime ends. These names are derived from the carbon atoms present in the sugar molecule. For instance, here we have 1', prime, 2', prime, 3', prime, 4', prime, and 5'. Prime. When we look at carbons in the sugar molecule in DNA and RNA, the 1' prime carbon links the sugar molecule to the nitrogenous base. The 2' prime carbon is attached to an hydroxyl group in RNA and attached to a hydrogen atom in DNA. The 3' prime and the 5' prime carbon are used to create a phosphodiester bond between the nucleotides. 
So looking at this schematic overview, this is the 5 prime carbon and the 3 prime carbon. And it is this 3 prime carbon that is linked to the 5 prime carbon of the next nucleotide. So when we look on top of the molecule, we can see the 5 prime carbon here. And when we look bottom up, we can observe the 3 prime carbon here. So actually the orientation of this strand is 5 prime to 3 prime. DNA strands are reverse orientated. This means that in one strand we have a 5 prime to 3 prime orientation and in the other strand it's reverse. So we have a 3 prime to 5 prime orientation. Also we have four different bases in DNA. Guanine, adenine, thymine or cytosine which are abbreviated G, A, T, C. And these form specific pairs. So for instance, A pairs with T and G pairs with C. The pairing between the nitrogenous bases is performed by hydrogen bonds. AT bonds have two hydrogen bonds and GC bonds have three. So these GC bonds are stronger than the AT bonds. In coding sequences, three letter codes or triplets or codons code for one of the 20 amino acids. And actually multiple triplets can code for the same amino acid. For instance, if you look at T, A, T or T, A, C, these two triplets both code for the amino acid tyrosine. You have to note that different organisms or different cell organelles may use different genetic codes or translation tables. So the standard code is referred to as translation table 1. In the framework of plant health, we often work with mitochondrial DNA loci. And one of the codes that we often have to apply is the invertebrate mitochondrial DNA code, table 5. Also, the bacteria and chloroplast code, table 11, is frequently used. To demonstrate the effect of the translation table applied, we have an exercise. And for this, we'll be using the Genius Sequence Analysis software. Here you can see the mitochondrial COX-1 gene of Anaplophora glabripennis, the Asian longhorn beetle. This 1566 nucleotide sequence is annotated. The annotation in green is the gene annotation and the annotation in yellow is the coding sequence annotation. When we zoom in we can see the nucleotide sequence. And if we translate this sequence using the standard code in frame 1, then we immediately see the introduction of stop codons here and there, indicating that this is a non-functional translation of the gene. But when we apply the correct code, because as I told, this is a mitochondrial gene from a beetle, and translation table 5, the invertebrate mitochondrial code, applies. 
when we use this code, we can see there are no internal stop codons left. So you really can see from this example how the use of a genetic code translating the DNA sequence to an amino acid sequence can influence the outcome. In the example we saw just now, the gene annotation was the same as the coding sequence annotation. Since the nuclear encoded genes in eukaryotes often consist of exons and introns, and it is the information found in the exons which make up the coding sequences. So from the DNA you have transcription of the DNA to a pre-messenger RNA which includes both the introns and exons. Introns are then spliced out of that sequence and you end up with the mature messenger RNA. And this messenger RNA is translated into a protein. So also for this we have an example in Genius. Here you see the elongation factor 1 alpha gene of the fungus Fusarium pseudograminiarum. And actually when you look at that annotation you can see in green the gene annotation and in yellow the coding sequences. So these are the exons and in between we have the intronic sequences. So in the elongation factor 1 alpha gene is actually one of the barcoding genes that are used for fungi and plant health. So we can zoom in again and when we translate this sequence using frame 1 and the standard code, so the standard code translation table 1 is applicable for this nuclear encoded gene, but if we just use frame 1 and ignore the fact that this is made up of exons and introns, then we can see that if we would just ignore the intronic sequence, that we would end up with a stop code on here. So, but since this intronic sequence is spliced out in a mature messenger RNA, that wouldn't bother us. So, if we would translate this based on the annotations, then the intronic sequences are ignored. And you can see that actually no internal stop codons are found again. For DNA barcoding purposes, it is sometimes needed to know the architecture of your gene that you're using in identification. Also to assess the quality of the consensus sequences you're using that are used as input for uh, the analysis itself. Now let's talk about DNA barcoding. I've used the term already on a number of occasions, but what is DNA barcoding? DNA barcoding is the use of a small genetic standardized marker for species identification. And it is similar to using the barcodes on the items you buy in a shop to differentiate one from another. Now a successful DNA barcode is short, universal, easy to amplify and has a high diagnostic resolution. In terms of size, typically these are designed to allow sequencing using Sanger sequencing technology, so ranging from 400 to 800 base pairs. In terms of universality, they should be applicable for a broad range of organisms or a broad range of different taxa. Ease of amplification, the availability of generic amplification primers is needed, and a DNA barcode has high diagnostic resolution. So low variation within the species, but high variation between species. To put the size of a DNA barcode in context of its genome, we've got an example. So this 
is the common fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, which has a genome of 122.6 megabases. And actually, the barcode that you're using for species identification is 685 base pairs. So that's only a very small percentage of the genome. We can further illustrate that by looking at barcode locus in Genius. This is version 6 of the Drosophila melanogaster genome. You can see the different chromosomes and on the smaller ones already some gene annotations are visible. So but actually when we zoom in, the gene annotation becomes apparent. And now we are looking at a window of one megabases here, so that's one million bases. And if we further zoom in, here we see the mitochondrial genome. And then if we further zoom in, oh, let me slide over a bit, we can find the COX-1 gene. So the COX-1 gene typically is one and a half kilobase long. And it is the lower part of that gene that you use for species identification. So actually, this small piece is the barcode that tells you something about the identity of this species with this vast genome. There are several official recognized DNA barcode loci. So the mitochondrial C1, the one that we saw just now for Drosophila, is the barcode for animals, bird, fish. The chloroplast, Materase K and RBCL are the two loci used for plant identification. The nuclear IDS region for fungi. And the last one, not officially recognized as a barcode, but massively applied for prokaryotes are the ribosomal RNA genes. So what does a generic DNA barcoding workflow look like? Obviously, first you need to have a sample, extract DNA from it, amplify the barcoding locus, sequence it, and in this course we are focusing on Sanger sequence data, so not next-gen sequence data, processing the data to create a consensus sequence, and then querying that data against online databases that will help you to come to a species identification. So that's DNA barcoding in general. But now let's take a look at DNA barcoding specific in plant health. Since the recognition of the official DNA barcode, many initiatives have been launched. And most of them have been focusing on the already established barcodes. However, the official recognized barcodes are not always suitable for many of the regulated plant pests and invasive plant species. And for some of the groups, no official barcodes were available. For instance, phytoplasmas and bacteria. Also, one locus is often not enough for plant pest identification at the level of phytosanitary measures. So for instance, for bacteria, you have bacteria that are regulated on a pathover level or a subspecies level. And then the generically used 16S ribosomal DNA doesn't provide you with sufficient resolution for subspecies or pathovar identification. To address this, the QBall project was initiated to develop barcoding protocols for selected regulated organisms and that covered arthropods, bacteria, fungi, nematodes and phytoplasmas. And these protocols were validated in an international test performance study. From this test performance study, several recommendations for improvements were made, which were addressed under the Eurofresco DNA barcoding project. Under this project, new tests for several bacteria, 
fungi and invasive plant species were added. Quality assurance considerations were addressed. And for each organism group, a generic process control was introduced. Now together, the QBOL and your Fresco DNA barcoding projects resulted in the preparation of an APO standard, which was published in November 2016. This APO standard, together with all other APO standards, can be found on the APO website and downloaded for free. Now this concludes presentation 1.2 from the Practibar course and we hope you've enjoyed watching the video. We'd like to welcome you to view the other videos of the Practibar course as well and should you have any questions feel free to drop us a line.